Hi, everyone, and thanks for coming. I'm Lu Luis Jaramillo, the Associate Chair of uh, the School of Writing here at the New School. And I'm so pleased to be introducing tonight's readers, Vaughn Diaz, Tiffany Anik, Marie Myung Ak Lee, and Monique Trong. Um, I often think that writing about food allows writers and other artists to get a, at a subject through the side door. Uh, the side door uh, that we're getting into this time, of course, is immigration. And um, these four writers have different ways of doing it, and I'm really excited to hear what they read tonight. Uh, I'd also like to uh, plug the Inquisitive Eater, the journal here at the New School for Food. Um, I guess it's the Inquisitive Eater is meant to be just a very large side door where we can uh, reach all different kinds of topics um, through the venue of food. Um, we publish creative writing as well as essays and academic work and uh, other kinds of artwork like ph photography and um, we even take paintings. Um, so please consider contributing to the Inquisitive Eater, which is at inquisitiveeater.org. Um, oh, sorry, dot com. <laughs> um, and please welcome now Von Diaz, a multimedia journalist and oral historian based in New York City. Her reporting and research focuses on immigration, Latino culture, Cuba, and LGBT issues. She currently works as the marketing and communications manager at El Museo del Barrio in New York City. She was born in Puerto Rico and holds a dual MA in journalism in Latin American and Caribbean studies from NYU and a BA in women's studies from Agnes Scott College. Her work has been published by PRI's The World, Latino USA, WNYC, and New American Media. She is a journalist for Feet in Two Worlds, a program of the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. Please welcome Von Diaz. Hi, everybody. Let's see if that works. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of an intro into a project um, that's very much evolving as we speak. Um, so again, I'm, I'm Von Diaz, and um, I am within uh, being a reporter for Feet in Two Worlds. I'm also a reporter for Food in Two Worlds, which is a journalism project of um, uh, here at, at the New School. And Food in Two Worlds began in 2011 as a series of podcasts on feetintwoworlds.org and recently won the award for um, best Fort Shorm best short form audio from the International Association of Culinary Professionals. Um, in addition to podcasts and web articles, it um, also features, uh, pu produces features for public radio and offers food tours of New York's immigrant neighborhoods. So, um, sorry, I need to get this just right. Okay, um, so uh, today I'll be reading a couple stories from a recent project that's sort of a Puerto Rican Julie and Julia project. Um, I will be cooking my way over the next several months through a book called uh, Cocina Criolla, which is um, here on the um, projected. And um, uh, while this project was inspired in many ways by my desire to explore my own cultural identity, through taste, I also aim to explore a variety of universal themes related to food, flavor, cultural hybridity, and identity. Uh, Port uh, Puerto Rican cuisine, if you're not familiar with it, is notoriously unhealthy. It's um, very high in fat and carbs, very low in vegetables, and heavily reliant on frying. Um, perhaps it's no surprise then that Puerto Rico has the highest rate of diabetes uh, of any U.S. state or territory, and Puerto Ricans are at higher risk uh, than other Latino groups for medical conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension. Uh, and it also seems that uh, a flawed food system is in play here as well. Um, apparently 80% of the food in Puerto Rico uh, is imported, despite the island having fully adequate capability to grow food. Uh, so through this series, I want to look closely at cuisine vis-a-vis -vis this cookbook, uh, since the food in it continues to be uh, staple, th these continue to be staple dishes. And I want to ask questions about the relationship between diet and health and culture. Um, I want to ask questions like, you know, why do people continue to eat unhealthily when we have all the tools we need to, to eat really healthily? And uh, what are the intersections between taste, race, class, history, and to what degree Degree, um, is what we eat an extension of a necessary connection to culture and ethnicity. So with that, I'll read the first story of this series, um, which is titled Fear of Frying. It just uh, ran on feetintoworlds.org yesterday. Uh, you're welcome to check it out. And uh, here I go. I don't fry. 
I don't own a splatter guard, even though I could get one at any dollar store. I cook with olive oil and butter, coconut oil if I'm feeling fancy, but I don't fry. I'm a Puerto Rican who can't dance salsa and loves vegetables. Despite these ethnic shortcomings, I feel deeply connected to Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican culture and to the foods that help me keep in touch with my Puerto Rican identity. I didn't realize just how deep the connection was until I found a copy of Cocina Criolla on a, at a local bookstore. Memories of my grandmother in her kitchen in Atorre, peeling yuca in her flip-flops with her hair in rollers, came flooding back as I held the book in my hands, charmed by its ugly front cover with bad drawings of tropical fruit. Cocina Criolla is the Betty Crocker of Puerto Rican cuisine. Instead of mac and cheese, it has recipes for pig's feet stew, braised cow tongue, and a cornucopia of fried goodies. First published in 1954 and currently in its 65th edition, this culinary Bible, written in Spanish, still occupies a special place in every Boricua Mama and Abuela's bookshelf. Its pages stained with olive oil and tomato, recipes scribbled over with notes and adjustments. Its author, Carmen Valdeyuli, from one of Puerto Rico's aristocratic families, has been called the Puerto Rican Julia Child. I've decided to cook my way through this book, exploring Puerto Rican culture as I go along. My grandmother lived by it, my mother worshiped it, and now I'm starting a journey through its pages. Food and culture go hand in hand, and through this adventure, I want to better understand the nostalgia I feel when I encounter Puerto Rican foods, but I also want to build a new relationship with those familiar tastes and feelings. What better place to start than confronting my fear of frying, the basis of so much Puerto Rican food? I'll admit I'm worried I'm gonna gain 20 pounds through this project. I'm also worried that I may have to eat tripe, even though I'm pretty sure it'll always be gross. And mostly I'm worried that I've outgrown Puerto Rican food, that because it's so heavy, so incredibly unhealthy, so lacking in beta carotene and healthy amino acids, that there's no place in my adult life as a transplanted Puerto Rican in New York City. But as the Julie in this Puerto Rican Julie Julia scenario, I'm hoping to conjure Carmen Valdeyuli through her recipes and find a new home for these dated dishes in my own repertoire. Cocina Criolla is terribly written, the index is wholly unreliable, and there are no photos, only charming illustrations of Puerto Rican peasants or jibaros, plated dishes and utensils. The recipes themselves are mostly guides with vague instructions such as cook until done. <laughs> the recipe uses every part of the animal from tip to tail and relies heavily on labor-intensive processes. And at a time when processed foods are becoming increasingly suspect, I want to explore whether all that added work makes things more delicious. If I go out and buy a machete and crack my own coconuts, will the resulting dessert be the best ever? <laughs> but before breaking out the machete, I've decided to start with a simple fried dish. Sorullitos are cigar-shaped fritters that are basically deep-fried grits or polenta, made delightfully porky by cooking in lard. They are one of the most popular Puerto Rican snacks. And when I was a little girl, my mother used to wrap me in a blanket and tell me I was a little sorullito, and then she would tickle me with nibbles like I was a fried treat. I thought of my mom as I made my own sorullitos, tightly rolling each one the way she used to wrap me. Sorullitos are only complete when paired with the simplest of condiments, mayo ketchup, or mayo quechu, as it's commonly pronounced. It's exactly what it sounds like, equal parts mayonnaise and ketchup, but reconized with fresh garlic and a little hot sauce. It's basically Russian dressing, substitute garlic for relish, but in many ways the kind of condiment you'd blend on your plate of French fries, and a fitting metaphor for Puerto Rican American hybridity. What's the basis for my fear of frying? Oil splatters, and it hurts. And heaven forbid you accidentally get a drop of water in the pan. Disaster. Uh, plus, nutritionists have made enough convincing arguments on how fried food increases your risk for heart disease and other such things. But I conquered my fear of frying with Carmen as my guide and a bit of science. I poured what seemed an excessive amount of oil into a standard deep saucepan and used a candy thermometer, brought the oil to exactly 375 degrees. The result was perfection, the sorullitos fried evenly with no oil splatter, came out crisp and golden brown. My close friends were guinea pigs in my Julie Julia Von Carmen experiment, and I even put them to work. The sorullitos were a hit. We qu quickly devoured all 50, and I learned a few important lessons on my path to Cocina Criolla enlightenment. One, it's totally okay to make a deep fried appetizer, particularly if you're serving it with a healthier meal or at least something green on your plate. Two. Don't stress about using a ridiculous amount of oil to deep fry. You need it. Three, sometimes it's totally worth it to fry. Fried things are delicious. Oh, and I should buy a splatter guard because it looks like I'll be doing a lot more frying. <laughs> uh, 
I'm going to read one more story from the series um, that is, has not yet published, and uh, there is some multimedia to go along with it. Uh, this one is called Tongue Tied. What can I say about beef tongue? When I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area, I discovered tacos de lengua at Taqueria Cancun in the Mission District. I ate them at least once a week, enjoying their texture, delightfully spongy yet crisp around the edges with an earthy, gamey flavor. I've continued to enjoy lengua tacos in El Barrio, the neighborhood where I live in New York. I'd never prepared beef tongue, nor had I seen it prepared. Usually, in a tongue taco, the meat is chopped into small pieces and served on a core tortilla with the usual toppings, which is a far cry from serving an entire tongue as an entree. But Carmen Valdeyuli's recipe for lengua estofada, or stuffed beef tongue, seemed a fitting way to continue to learn from her authoritative book on Puerto Rican cooking and experiment with something I knew I loved. So I took to the streets to find a tongue. El Barrio's Mexican population has been growing, leading locals to call certain blocks Little Puebla after the Mexican state. At Lexington Avenue and 103rd Street, a block that still boasts a Puerto Rican cultural center and huge mural representing 1960s Puerto Rican East Harlem, the street is flanked on one side by a burrito joint and a Mexican grocery store, and on the other side by a gourmet Mexican restaurant and an upscale taco shop. My first stop on my trip was the Casablanca Meat Market, a fabulous Latino butcher on 110th Street that has a front window filled with gigantic slabs of chicharrón, comically big, as if made from a whole side of pig. But it was Sunday, a day when stores still close in this neighborhood. I did what any other New Yorker would do and searched Yelp for the closest open butcher shop. The Little Mexico Meat Market came up first, and my Mexico to Puerto Rico tongue connection came full circle. Hanging from the ceiling were streams of papel picada or colored paper streamers and pinatas, and the entryway was full of baskets of dried chilies and beans. And there it was, my beef tongue, in the glass case, longer and thicker than my forearm and wrapped in plastic. I also purchased jamón de cocinar, an ingredient for the stuffing, and left the store delighted with my purchase. Cocina Criolla is full of scary meats, and lengua is certainly one of them. When I came home and unwrapped the tongue from the protective plastic, I was speechless. It looked like an alien creature, and just too much like a tongue. I also wasn't prepared for the way it felt, very solid and similar to a piece of rubber tire covered in tiny hairs like those on a cat tongue. I'd never had tongue growing up, even though it's common, it's common Puerto Rican fare, because my mother thinks it's gross. She would tell me the story of coming home from school, I imagine her in her burgundy Catholic school uniform, going into the kitchen to get a snack and shrieking at the sight of a giant cow tongue plopped in the kitchen sink. And I had issues almost immediately. The first step was to boil the tongue for 30 minutes, but I think Chef Carmen got it wrong. I watched YouTube, that's right, real chefs, I learned to cook from YouTube, to get advice on how to prep and handle the tongue. The preparations varied wildly and none resembled Chef Carmen's instructions. Chef Carmen's technique did not loosen the skin at all, making me wish I'd peeled it before because now it was tough and hot. Boiling made the tongue look even more alien because the skin turned a kind of ecru color and the muscle tensed, making the tip turn up in a very tongue-like manner. But once the skin was off, I was surprised by how much tongue looked suspiciously like, well, beef. Next, I had to adobar or season and stuff the tongue the way you would prepare a pernil or pork roast. The final step marked the end of the tongue handling trauma and the rest was simmering and waiting. Sneakily, I invited a group of unsuspecting friends to partake in the tongue lashing, I mean, tasting. When I announced the main dish, the color drained from their faces and one friend looked a little nauseous, but they were all foodie thrill seekers and were up for the challenge. Salud. Once it, was, once it was finished cooking, I served the sliced tongue over rice with the sauce from the pot, boiled potatoes, and a simple salad. Everyone cleaned their plates, and in the end, the tongue made for great dinner conversation. And with that, I'd like to show a video from the project. This is Bon Diaz with Food in Two Worlds, and I'm making lengua estofada, or stuffed beef tongue, from the Puerto Rican cookbook, Cocina Criolla. Yeah, that, that, is, oh, yeah, where, that, is. that is already in the microwave. To start, you'll thoroughly rinse a two to three pound beef tongue, then boil for 30 minutes in salted water. Then, you'll remove the tongue carefully from the boiling water and peel. Here's how it's done. There you go. Yeah. Oh my god. Wow. Wow. Oh wow. 
let the beef tongue cool slightly, then thoroughly peel the thick outer skin carefully with a sharp knife. Once peeled, you'll make several deep holes along the edges and middle of the beef tongue. Then, stuff the tongue with a mixture of ham, salt pork, and sofrito. Place the tongue back in the pot and cook for four hours with white wine, prunes, onions, and bay leaves. Buen provecho. Man, this is the weirdest thing I have ever participated in the cooking of. But it looks awesome. Well, it smells awesome, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I don't know about the looks. I can see why they put this in a taco, right? Yeah, I'm not entirely it's, it's sure how it's gonna be to eat like, over rice. Well, we're gonna just how slice it up really thin, right? Thanks so much, Vaughn. Uh, Our next reader is Tiffany Yannick, an assistant professor in the MFA School of Writing here, a friend and colleague. She's also the author of How to Escape from a Leper Colony. Yannick's writing has won the 2011 Bokos Prize for Caribbean Fiction, the Boston Review Prize in Fiction, Arona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, Pushcart Prize. She is the recipient of a Fulbright Scholarship and an Academy of American Poets Prize. She has been listed by the Boston Globe as one of the 16 cultural figures to watch out for, and by the National Book Foundation as one of the 2010 Five Under 35, a list announcing the next generation of fiction writers. Please welcome Tiffany Yannick. Hi, good evening, you guys. Um, thank you to Louise for having us, um, and thank you so much to the other readers. I'm so looking forward to hearing Maria, Monique, and Van. That was really cool. <laughs> that was gross and maybe delicious. Was it delicious? Okay, so it was delicious. Can I close this? Is this going to mess anything up? Okay. <clears throat> uh, Van and I have something in common, which is that um, on a panel about immigrants uh, or about immigration, about a panel, a whole conference really about immigration. Uh, we are bizarre kind of immigrants to the US in that we are Americans, Ben and I both, uh, by birth, uh, born in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico and myself in the Virgin Islands, and yet arrive in the US as kind of immigrants to our own country um, and feel like outsiders, and yet we are carrying American passports. So it's a bizarre kind of experience of finding yourself an immigrant um, when you have finally arrived in your mother country. <clears throat> I'm going to be reading from my book, How to Escape from a Leper Colony. And part of my anxiety as, of being a, an American who still uh, operates and feels like an immigrant uh, in my own work was that I often push against some of the things that immigrants are often told to do in their writing, that we're encouraged to do in writing workshops when we're undergrads and even graduate students. Um, and I had professors tell me things like, well, you know, where are the coconuts? Where are, you know, where, where is the peas and rice? You know, wh where is that stuff that I can access your culture? And I often w would say, well, you know, fuck that. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and, and that I, I felt almost as if that was a, that was something that faculty was often asking me to do that was exotifying my work and um, was maybe making my work way too easy to, to access for outsiders and maybe um, then alienating for actual insiders who are not constantly thinking about peas and rice and coconuts, right? Uh, so it turns out that when I do use food, which I use quite often in my work, I use it much more metaphorically. Um, and sugar is a really important thing in the Caribbean. Uh, as many of you might know, uh, sugar is in part why the Caribbean as it stands today exists today. Um, it's why uh, slaves were uh, brought over from Africa to the Caribbean and uh, why the Caribbean was so important to Europe and to America. America because of sugar. Um, so again, this story is, uh, is from How to Escape from a Leper Colony, and it's called Kill the Rabbits. It's from the voice of a young man. So you have to just imagine that it's not me, but it's a dude. Okay. When I was about 10 years old, I learned to lie. This, as with all my other vices, came of love. I loved sugar. Raw brown sugar, 
I love that the grains were thick and amber colored. I love that if you put some in your mouth, you had to crunch on them and they wouldn't melt like the dust of the bleached process kind. I love the smell of molasses the brown grains gave off. They were real. White sugar seemed smooth and fake, like a girl in my fifth grade class who wore too much lipstick. White sugar seemed to be trying hard to be something it was not. We didn't get brown sugar in the house often because it was more expensive, but sometimes my mother would need it and then I would find ways to devour it. On the day I learned to lie, I poured myself a glass of milk. To sweeten it, I poured in brown sugar straight from the bag. I sipped the milk and continued pouring and sipping until I had a cup of drenched sugar with a very shallow layer of milk on top. I was impressed with myself for making this new treat and for hiding it like a magician. I put away the bag of sugar and sat at the table to eat my milk sugar with a spoon, and that was when my mother swung in. If you ask me now, she must have watched me all along. She must have waited for me. She took out the bag of brown sugar and asked me why the bag was so near empty. I shrugged, sipped my milk, careful not to gather up any of the sugar. Cooper, she asked, how much of my sugar you put in the milk? None, mommy. So then where all the brown sugar that was in this bag? I don't know, mommy. You best tell me or you're gonna get beat, Cooper. Now, what is the need for the truth really all about? If she knew, why didn't she just take the cup from me? Why was it so important that I confess? Mommy, I don't know where the sugar gone. Come here, Cooper. I got up from the table and walked to her, not once looking back at my cup to incriminate myself. When I was close enough, she grabbed me by the arm like I imagined she must grab robbers on the street before lowering them into her squad car. Why are you lying, Cooper? Just tell me. But mommy, I don't know anything. She raised her hand and smacked me on the arm. I still didn't know. She unleashed her belt and brought it down in my back. I still didn't know. Again and again, I didn't know. I crouched on the floor, crying. She went to the table and snatched up my cup and poured it out into the sink, and I stared with horror and disbelief at the sugar as it came slopping out. A whole cup full of my expensive brown sugar. How did it get there, Cooper? But I didn't know. I had no idea, and she beat me again and again until I was tired and my body was welted, and I never knew how the sugar got into the cup. Finally, she let me be. You scare me, Cooper, she said, and left me welted on the floor. For the life of me, I could not figure out how the sugar got in the cup. Somewhere in my body, I knew I had done it. Somewhere in me was the memory of pouring the sugar in, of crunching the sugar in my teeth. But if you had given me a lie detector test, I would have passed. The only rule of good lying is the ability to convince yourself. So of course, I became a liar and a thief. I couldn't help the cliche, which didn't go over well with my mother, who you must know is a cop. My guess is that she's the reason they keep me here in this St. Thomas jail. She likes to visit me and make sure they're sneaking in some of that skunk ganja from Jamaica. This is how I ended up here. The carnival, I was 16. It was on a Wednesday. Half day of school so that we could go to the food fair. And if you waited even until noon, all the best conch and butter sauce would be sold out but I wasn't even at the food fair. That Sunday was church. Before, I had met Zika. She was at my brother's christening. We were related somehow, but she was on my brother's daddy's side. She noticed me first. She was older than me, but she didn't look like the religious type. Her dress was grabbed around her waist and she was wearing big gold hibiscus earrings. But with these girls, you never know. They want diamonds and Jesus at the same time. 
We will be one in love, the song finished. She leaned into the seat, but stopped before her back touched the pew. She was perched, ass alone, holding her up. And she whispered to me, I like Simon Peter best. I noted that her face was the sweet color of brown sugar. When she left the church, I followed her out. She didn't just dip her finger in the holy water. She cupped it out and splashed on her sign of the cross. Outside, the beads of water were still on her forehead and spotted on the chest of her dress. An interesting yellow dress, tight on top with fluffy, puffy shoulders, like skin on her ass. The dress was glittering somehow, like maybe it was done up with gold thread or something. People were outside mingling and taking pictures of my mother and the baby. The baby was wearing a long white dress. The family was supposed to go to a brunch at some expensive hotel out East End that was reserved for tourists and such occasions. But now Zika was walking back behind the church. And so I followed. I wondered if I knew her. I wonder if I'd seen her around. St. Thomas is a small island and everyone looks familiar. I followed her to the side of the church where the stone wasn't painted over. She nestled behind these big winding stairs that went up to the place where the priest lived. It smelled like pee. I never followed a girl to a small, smelly corner before, and I kept looking back to see if my mother would forget me and go to the brunch without me. But this girl says, I'm Zika. And before I could tell her, well, I'm Cooper, but you can call me Coop, she had pushed up against me and was kissing me, and we were clutching each other, and our mouths were wet with our own juices, and different parts of my body were going limp or stiff. And then she pulled away. But I pulled her back because I wasn't done with this brown sugar. Our faces were right up against each other. She looked at me hard. She must have been a woman, really, like 18. That's it, she said. It was nice. And she pulled away so quickly that her necklace busted off in my hand. Shit, she cursed, then crossed herself. Keep it. Then she snapped away. I was in love. That was it. I was in love with this girl named Zika, and all she had done was kiss me behind the church. She didn't come to brunch. She wasn't invited. That carnival, I was overtaken by the slapping of steel pan and the clanging of cowbells. The food fair was so rammed that it was easy to stick my hand in a white woman's pockets and take her money as she pressed her puffy twat against my hand, thinking I was looking for something else. I stole from tourist women mostly. It was easier than magic. If you'd asked me then why I was stealing, I would have said to buy a better necklace from my brown sugar Zika, one that wouldn't break so easily. Hey, Coop. Hey, Coopster, Coopadelic. That was sexy. I mean, that's his friggin' name, okay? No lie, I guess he's sexy, but I wouldn't know about that. That carnival, he called me over to his car. He opened the side door and let me in. This is how I really know sexy. That carnival, he gave me a gun. That's how everyone knows sexy. I didn't need the gun. I was making more than enough just picking pockets. Sexy was into other stuff. Sexy was into everything, a real hustler. He had a hustler's job. He worked at the racetrack organizing the betting. And he had soldiers all over the island. He found out about my quick fingers. I don't need a gun, sexy. So what? I don't want it, sexy. You're small time, Coop. You could be making some real money, young thing. Man, sexy, I still in high school. Let me graduate already. Take it, Coop. It's a gift, a temporary gift. Consider it a loan or no interest. I didn't know how to use it. He leaned over to me in the passenger seat. Here's a safety. Leave it locked unless you plan on doing something. Too many guys in jail for mistakes. And this is the barrel. I couldn't even tell if it was loaded. No bullets, he said. Sexy, you know my mom's a cop? She's going to kill me. Listen, Coop, hold it for me. Make it disappear like a magician. So I took the gun. I hid it in the alley by the church, behind the stairs where I'd met Zika. It was so many months later when the cops found it that I'd forgotten all about it. 
As far as I was concerned, it really had disappeared. Later, when the cops found it, there were two prints, mine and someone else's. They never figured out who else. Someone who'd not been printed. Maybe a priest, maybe Zika's. But the gun is what cinched me. They said I'd stolen the diamonds from this tourist couple out East End. The tourist pointed and said that yes, it was me. That I'd held them up at gunpoint, taken advantage of the wife, then slammed the husband into sleep with my piece. But I didn't do it, really. But it didn't matter. Because it was like with my mother when she found the sugar. When they found the gun behind the stairs, I was horrified. They were my prints and not even sexies. I mean, maybe, just maybe, a tourist woman found me roaming the streets that Saturday after the parade looking for Zika. My clown suit costume zipped down to my waist and maybe she touched my shoulder and slid her hand under my sweaty undershirt and looked at me like I was licorice. I mean, suppose I went back to her timeshare and she introduced me to her husband and they both wanted to fuck me but I said I would only do the wife because I wouldn't be a batty boy for their fetish. And maybe I did, or maybe I didn't let the woman climb on top of me and let her husband watch as he chanted, ride that island monkey, ride it. And maybe I stole the diamond chain around her neck and the diamond tennis bracelet off her wrists and the diamond earrings right out of her goddamn ears and rolled out with all of it when the man tried to make a move. I'm not a hustler, I'm a magician, but they still got me on rape and assault with a deadly weapon and with illegal use of an unlicensed firearm and with stealing the earrings and the bracelet, but they never found the necklace. I made that disappear. I pleaded innocent, I'm telling you, I'd never seen that tourist couple before in my life. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Um, our next reader is Marie Myung Ak Lee, a fiction and nonfiction writer. Her work has appeared in Guernica, Witness, Five Chapters, The New York Times, The New York Times Magazine, The Washington Post, Slate, and she is a regular contributor to The Atlantic and Salon. She is the author of Somebody's Daughter, a Minnesota Book Award finalist. She's been a Fulbright Scholar and a Fellow at McDowell, Yaddo, and VCC, and is a founder and former board president of the Asian American Writers Workshop. She teaches creative writing at Brown and Columbia, and her next novel is forthcoming with Simon & Schuster in 2015. Yes. Please welcome Marie Myung Ak Lee. Thank you, Luis, for inviting me, um, to Fabio and Arian, and to the New School. Really excited to be here and talking about food. My fellow writers, um, and actually, Tiffany, the, one of the reasons that the Asian American Writers Workshop got started was a bunch of us were sitting around at a restaurant saying, we are too sick of people always asking us to write about rice. So I'm actually, I'm really excited to be here and to, to read from my forthcoming novel, and I don't even know if there's any rice in it, so. Um, the thing that you should know is it's a huge novel. I'm just reading a small part of it. Um, the, in this part, Youngman Kwok is a retired physician who has finished up 40 years as an OBGYN in rural northern Minnesota. And he and his wife have just moved to suburban Minneapolis to be closer to their son. Dr. Youngman Kwok awoke from his nap, still stumbling a bit. Oh, he hated that old man's shuffle. He made his way to the kitchen, yanked open the door of the food closet. He pawed through bags of spicy squid jerky, tongmian noodles, chicken in a biscuit, cans of bamboo shoots, centrum silver vitamins, bags of rice, dried piogo fungus, tins of sardines, boxes of raisins, stacked cans of spam, sun chips provided from the drug company lunch, compliments of Innova, the less androgenic hormone solution until his scrabbling paws fell upon his goal, a package of keem. He broke open the foil-lined bag, exactly five pieces of greeny black salted and roasted seaweed in its pleated plastic bed. Precise cut, pre-cleaned, pre-salted, practically pre-eaten, and enclosed in plastic, plastic, plastic. But the good thing about it, it fit in his pocket, perfect for a snack later. 
He moved to the living room, his nylon socks throwing off sparks from the deep pile wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Calisthenics time. He bobbed up and down, touching his toes. His trousers bit into his stomach, so he unpantsed himself. He was gluteus maximi airborne when the front door opened and his wife, Young A, walked in. Yeah! She quickly slammed it, then leaned her back against it like the ladies in the movies do when being pursued by monsters. The brown paper cub foods bag in her hand dropped to the floor. What in the world, said Young A. What are you doing? What does it look like I'm doing? My stretches. Hana, dul, set. How was your church meeting? Oh, young people day, she muttered, upending the cub foods bag onto the kitchen table. A bunch of Ziploc bags flopped out, each filled with what looked like trial-sized tubes of toothpaste. I had to bring these back from the food drive. What are they? Korean air hot pepper paste. She held up the robin's egg blue tube emblazoned with the red and blue umyang symbol of the Tao. They serve bibimbap on other in-flight meals, and this is how they pack the gochujang for it. Hot pepper paste mellowed with fermented sweet rice was a key ingredient in just about any Korean meal, which is why in a Korean household it was made in huge quantities and stored outside in a giant ceramic crock big enough to cook a missionary. What an ingenious idea to put it in a squeeze tube for use by air travelers. Young Min was, once again, proud to be a member of the Korean race. You see, she said, three meals on a 14-hour flight, that's six tubes per person every time you go to Korea. And you know how our age people are. Everyone saves them. Bags and bags of them. Mrs. Kim and I thought these would be perfect for the elderly to sneak a little spice into their food in those awful nursing homes where they just serve that tasteless Western kibble. But the young people said we can't use these because they're opened. Of course they are, Youngman said. But the children forbid it, saying it was unsanitary. Unsanitary? Youngman couldn't help but guffaw. I know, young, young S said. But the young ones brought it to a vote at the last council meeting. We can't put uneaten kimchi back in the jar either after the praise lunches. Young A smiled a bit, remembering the maid thrusting her arms up to the elbow into the kimchi crock to scoop up handfuls of it, often furtively lapping up some at the same time. The young people are insisting it's disrespectful to give them used food when these elderlies are the people who are still with us today because they survived the war by eating boiled garbage and rats. And used kimchi is not unsanitary. If times ever get hard again, these kids are not going to make it, Youngman agreed. I can still taste the ketchup on those hot dog buns we found at the American garbage dump. Youngman had found such a treasure that day, the heel of a bun, which even though he had been starving, he broke neatly in two before gobbling his. Young A had archly accepted her portion. As the daughter of a merchant, she was already acquainted with Western bread. She waited until they were back at their poor shack made out of flattened sea ration cans and carefully placed her piece in a small dish of water and watched with delight as it puffed up to twice its size. But then it broke up and dissolved to nothing as she dissolved in tears, leaving young men to run back to the dump, desperately hunting until he found another. Say, what are you going to do with these? We couldn't bear to throw them away, so Mrs. Kim and I both took some home. Hmm, then may I take one, perhaps two? Young A looked up. Marum derohe, knock yourself out. She disappeared into the kitchen. Dinner was ready, the kitchen table set up, a soup tureen with a decorative pattern of walleyes ringing it. Bowl sat in the middle of the table, flanked by chopsticks, the robot-headed electronic rice cooker, this new Zojirushi neurofuzzy rice cooker was making a sustained beeping sound, a countdown to which its sensors deemed the make delicious ultimate freshness and texture coordinate. It actually has a computer chip in it that uses fuzzy, that uses fuzzy logic, their son had proudly explained. I made wild rice soup, young I said. Bon appetit. Oh, and I also stopped by the Bittners and gave them a check for their statue. Why did you do that? Young Min said, keeping his voice to a dull roar. Because we need to live harmoniously among others, she said. You're going to live here? Were the first words greeting their neighbor, was the first words of greeting their neighbors, the Bittners, had uttered, tromping uninvited into the Quak's new property as soon as their son was busily 
yanking up the Hiawatha Realty sign planted in the front lawn. Their unease was palpable. Young men could read in it a fear of dirtiness and disease, unsightly immigrant habits like hanging laundry in the front yard or eating roadkill. At a Chinese restaurant, they'd been caught doing this, exactly this, he'd heard on the radio. Youngman remembered how, even after he had his son spend the weekend erecting their cast iron eagle over the garage, the Uncle Sam Whirligig nailed to the lawn, the American flag hoisted on its pole, all the signifiers that should have screamed to you, them, we are just like you, they, remain, they remained aloof, anxious, resentful. When it was young men who had reason to be resentful, the Bittner woman, whenever she saw him, called anxiously to their dumb loping dog as if she were afraid young men was going to barbecue and eat him on the spot. The Bittners had preceded them to Songbird Estates by only a month, but as white people were wont to do, they didn't question their right to be there. Young men felt a deliberate, malicious intent in the way they placed their silly driveway markers, dual gigantic statues of horses' heads with brass rings through their mouths, creating an obstacle to pull wide of to wedge their car into the narrow driveway of their pork shop shaped property. So young man ends up drinking a little too much during this dinner. Um, and he's, so he's previously destroyed one of the neighbor's statues by driving his car into it. And then after this dinner, um, since he's drunk, he goes out for a walk and he accidentally falls and hits his head on the remaining horse statue. There was something oddly familiar about the uncomfortable thin mattress bed, the cheap curtain on rings. Ah, a hospital gurney, just like the ones he used to nap on while waiting out protracted labors. Young men blinked and then felt as if tiny shards of glass were raining down inside his head. He swung his legs to the side of the gurney, but then became so dizzy he almost fainted. But why was he here? The last thing he remembered was seeing the horse statue up close. Where was young A? Hello, he called tentatively. Hello, his voice crackled. His pants were covered in dirt and twigs. He must be in some urgent care facility. But who had brought him here? Had he been mugged? There was no nurse call button, button and the minuscule table by the bed held only an amesis basin and a crumpled package from a used alcohol wipe. By his side hung an IV bag, the line snaking unbelievably into his arm. Who put this here? No one should infiltrate Dr. Youngman Kwok with unknown fluids or drugs without his permission. He, un he immediately undid the IV, but there was no gauze handy, so a rivulet of blood ran underneath his fingers. Ugh, what a mess. Nurse, he croaked. It came out. <clears throat> he tried to clear his throat, but couldn't even manage the smallest bit of sputum. His mouth felt as dry as it did when he was first courting his wife. Aha, he had it. The salted keem, one of the most basic principles of biochemistry, sodium attracts water. He pulled the package out of the pocket and began to eat. Just as the curtain parted, a white man's face, eyes bugging out from behind his glasses, filled Youngman's view. Hey, Lundstrom, get over here. I need a hand. Hands held Youngman down. He felt someone fishing obscenely in his trouser pocket. He was coughing because instead of lubricating his mouth enough to speak, the keem, like wet paper, was sticking in his throat. Water, he croaked. Was he being robbed? He struggled against the restraining hand. So what's the deal, Meckle? said a voice after Youngman's left. Ah, geez, Dr. Lindahl, I just came on shift. He's a handoff from Altubelli, inebriated, uncommunicative, aneuretic, possible dementia, found wandering by himself on the street. I come in here, he's pulled out his IV, and he's chowing down on all this black paper. What should I do? Take it away from him. Clear his throat, Einstein. How long have you been on this service? Shouldn't we try to talk to him? Sir, can you tell us your name? Excuse me? Crack. See, he's totally out of it. Youngman was horrified and amazed that next the fingers that had been poking his trousers were now invading his mouth, wiggling in a hooking motion like someone had dropped a centipede in there, wrist hair poking at his lips. Where did he even get black paper? I'm not even sure he got it all. It's all mushy. Someone was intent on continuing to violate him orally, so Youngman did what he had to do. He bit down. Ouch! Meckle, quit it with the amateur hour. Get the four points. Before he knew what was happening, Dr. Youngman Kwok found himself bound and effectively gagged by the keem, splayed out on a gurney. The best he could do was make small arched back fish flops. The invading fingers were in his pockets again. 
where was he? Had he been kidnapped? Would you look at this? The orderly called Lundstrom held up young man's Ziploc bag of gochujang tubes. He's eating toothpaste too. The man turned to someone outside of young man's field of vision and said, yucka, in China, they got red toothpaste? That's rad, man. Well, you do remember those pink pills they used to give us in elementary school to see the places where we missed when we brushed? Oh yeah, it would turn your tongue all red, reminisced the orderly. Peter Peterson ate like seven of them all at once and barfed. His barf was bright pink with Cheerios on top. Youngman summoned all his will and managed to produce a bolus of spit, enough to wash down a fragment of keem. He contemplated how best to use the fewest of his rapidly fading words. Yes, to make it unequivocal, he would spell his name. Why you? The men heard it as a threat. Why you? Old toothpaste eating geezer threatening us, Lundstrom thumb type into his Facebook status. Just another entertaining Friday night at the Metro ER. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marie. Um, Monique Trong is a writer based in Brooklyn. She was born in Saigon, South Vietnam in 1968. Her first novel was The Book of Salt, which is a national bestseller and a recipient of the New York Public Library Young Lions Fiction Award, and a really fantastic book. Um, won many other awards. It was also honored as a New York Times notable fiction book, a Chicago Tribune favorite fiction book, and one of Miami Herald's top 10 books. Her second novel, Bitter in the Mouth, is an inaugural selection of the Ladies Home Journal Book Club and received the Rosenthal Family Foundation Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and was named a 25 Best Fiction Books of 2010 by Barnes & Noble, a 10 Best Fiction Books of 2010 by Hudson Booksellers, and the Adult Fiction Honor Book by the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association. Trong writes a monthly online food column entitled Ravenous for the New York Times Tea Magazine. She's also contributed to Real Simple, Town and Country, Condé Nast Traveler, Allure, Savour, Food and Wine Gourmet, The Times of London, Time Magazine, and other publications. Please welcome Monique Trong. Hello. Okay, I think tonight I'd like to share with you um, a little bit of nonfiction and then some fiction, okay? So, let's start with the non. <laughs> After my first novel was published, I was asked by the Penn Faulkner Foundation to write um, a short response to Eudora Welty's memoir entitled, One Writer's Beginnings. As Welty had done so eloquently, I was tasked with um, tracing my memories back to a moment when writing, which for me means writing larded with food, became a necessity for me. I found myself back at a relocation camp in April of 1975, and what I found there was this. One, a ridiculously symbolic first meal. Two, a note that contained words that I couldn't yet read, but would continue to haunt me. It was a memory so submerged that I actually had to call my mom just to make sure that it had happened. It's a memory that's rooted in a moment of forced migration that has altered and shaped my perspective on food and my imaginative relationship to it as well. And for me, it helps to explain why my brain and my belly have been so decidedly codependent. Uh, I never gave this piece a name, but I think, uh, I, I think I will today. I think I'm gonna call it camp food. So here goes. My memories have always been sealed with a taste. I remember people, places, and moments by the foods that I consume while in their presence or within their geography. In April of 1975, when I was six years old, I was at Camp Pendleton, a Marine Corps base in California. It had been turned into a refugee camp, and my mother and I were among the thousands of Vietnamese assigned to its hastily set up tents. 
Each tent, each canvas, A-frame deployable structure was a site of loss. Being human and being Vietnamese, we who say, have you eaten, when we mean, how are you? We, the inhabitants of this camp, tried to fill our emptiness by keeping our stomachs full. Food was provided to us from the back of truck beds. The lines were always long. Some lines led to baked chicken, which was very popular. Some led to unidentifiable masses covered in cheese, which were not popular. Some led to apples, some to oranges, and bananas always emptied the tents. In my family, which had grown suddenly so small, I was the gatherer. I stood in line for my mother, but she ate little of what I brought back except for the fresh fruits. One night, in some fit of desperation and madness and probably hunger, she sent me to the camp's officers club with a note and a $20 bill. I can't remember how I made my way to the building, which was, of course, off limits to us refugees. I can't remember to whom I handed the note, nor how long it took, or what I did while I was waiting. I don't remember whether I got any change back. I do remember returning to the tent with a paper bag, that inside were foil packets and that they were warm. I remember eating with my mother our first real meal in the United States, hamburgers and fries. How could the truth be such a cliche? The memory is so buried within me that when it does emerge, it surprises me. I have to ask myself, could that have really happened? Then I think about that note. What did my mother write? Was it formal and businesslike, the way that English can often be when the writer acquired it in a faraway country? Dear sir or madam, please, we would like to place an order. Or was it stark and clear in the way that grief can strip us all of artifice? I am 31 years old and I have a $20 bill, and I have one child. Please take the money. Please send the child back to me along with the food. P.S. Where is my husband? Whatever my mother wrote that night, they were the first English words to feed me. That note, the persistence of it in my memory, the taste that it still serves forth. And the speculation of what it could have said are the reasons why that note will always be the beginning of the story for me. So, that was camp note. Food, <laughs> camp food. <laughs> Thanks. So, here for the fiction, okay. So, you know, um, First, I have to say that in retrospect, I of course can understand now that all those people, you know, standing in long lines hour and after hour for food were clearly in shock, in grief, unmoored. But I know that the one thing that they probably were not was physically hungry, especially concerning the food at Camp Pendleton. And yet, food there was the obsession, the sole focus, and the task of the long days of otherwise not knowing what would come next. So instead of the larger, overwhelming, unimaginable things, we refugees focused on which truck had the best fruits, which had chicken, which one was serving egg foo young, which was a dish that we certainly did not recognize um, and that everyone called throw up. Um, <laughs> Perhaps, you know, more significantly for me, Camp Pendleton um, was for the first time in my life um, a moment when I was responsible for feeding my mother. Now, this is a reversal that 
clearly happens in a parent and child relationship. But um, it's a reversal that I have to say happened too early in my relationship with my mother. And that also taught me another incredibly important life lesson, which is the one who feeds you is the nurturer. The one who is fed is not. When we left Camp Pendleton, uh, my family went to a very small town in North Carolina called Bowling Springs. And uh, we lived there for the next three years. And my relationship with the American South, and specifically to that town, is a very complicated one. I mean, it's a region of the US, of course, that's famed for its gracious, effusive Southern hospitality. And certainly, in 1975, when we arrived, it was also known for its recalcitrant racism. I had been the beneficiary and the target of both during my childhood there. Um, so, you know, by setting my second novel uh, in Boiling Springs, I, it was really an attempt for me to try to revisit, to unpack, and to reclaim this place as my first American home. Uh, Bitter in the Mouth's main character is named Linda Hamrick, and she has a neurological condition that causes her to taste words. It's a secret sense that she can and does keep from the people around her, including her family. Linda's secret sense uh, forces her to learn, though, that at a tender age, that in order to fit into the world, she would need to ignore, suppress, and manipulate all that is strange and unusual, even when that is her very own body. Now, I cannot deny it. In Bitter in the Mouth, I renamed myself Linda Hamrick. I imagined a different family for myself, a different relationship to the sense of taste, and a different childhood and life to my own. But in the end, it remains a story of claiming a home in another self. So here's a very brief passage from chapter three of the book. In America, a country of abundance. In North Carolina, a state of plenty. Children were expected to share. Most childhood misbehaviors could be traced to a refusal to do so. And parents and teachers hurled reprimands accordingly. Stop being selfish. Why are you so selfish? Selfish children don't go to heaven. No dessert for the selfish. This last one was a favorite of my mother. She had learned from her mother that food was both reward and punishment. Considering what came into and out of my mother's kitchen, the unnecessarily canned vegetables, the shaken and baked, the hamburger helpmeats, and so on, the food at our table was always punishment. The last word of my mother's mealtime threat, though, was for me an antidote. The word selfish brought with it the taste of in of the summer corn on the cob. Not the kernels, but the juice at the honeycomb core after everything had been gnawed away. Poor Diane. She had no way of knowing why her rebukes always brought a smile to my face. This was my silent mealtime prayer. Say it again. Tell me I'm selfish. Please, help me get the taste of your dinner out of my mouth. The nightly cross that I had to bear was depend dependably one of the following casseroles. Chicken a la king, tuna noodle, tuna noodle, beefy macaroni. Consistency was the strong point of my mother's kitchen. Variety meant never having the same casserole two nights in a row. Variety also meant that the casserole's crispy topping was a rotation of breadcrumbs, crushed saltine crackers, broken potato chips, or Durkee's fried onions, the last only on Thanksgiving, Christmas, and other special occasions. For a brief time in the mid-80s, 
right before my father passed away, when Deanne was experimenting with exotic flavors. Her weekly menu also included a three-layer taco casserole. One of the layers was the contents of a small bag of potato chip, oh, corn chips and a chow mein surprise casserole. The surprise was several hot dogs cut into matchstick sized strips, which when cooked would curl up into little pink rubber bands. No matter the recipe, a can of condensed cream of mushroom soup, the all American binding agent of disparate food stuff was mixed in. The great assimilator, as I call it now, was responsible for the uniform taste of all of Deanne's casseroles, whether a la king, tuna, or beefy, different from beef itself. These casseroles also shared the same texture as if all their ingredients had been made to wear a sweater. I have since learned that foods named for the pot or pan that they were cooked in probably had little else going for them. <laughs> Meatloaf, bundt cake, for example. As I grew older and my affection for Deanne didn't, I began to throw her words back at her in the form of a question. No dessert for the selfish? I would ask her, as if she had admonished me in a foreign language that I couldn't quite understand. The act of repeating her words, of course, served multiple purposes. According to Deanne, I was being selfish because I hadn't finished my dinner. There were starving children in Africa, which she thought of as one big country, and my serving of casserole could have been sent to feed them at the dinner table. I was being selfish to save my life, and though they didn't know it, also the lives of my African counterpart. And it felt good. Thanks. Thank you so much, Monique. Um, I love the end of that essay, uh, the essay you read. Uh, you said that the first, um, the note that your mother sent were the first English words that fed you, and I feel like we're fed well tonight by these great readers. Thank you, Vaughn. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Monique. And thank you, Tiffany. Please give a round of applause for our readers. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming. Do we have any questions? Yes. Any other questions? All right, thanks everyone for coming. If you have books to sign, um, our readers would be happy to sign them for you. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>